evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are now in the valedictory session of this two and a half day conference, the argumentative Indian, critical debates in the world's largest democracy and perspectives from Australia. We began uh, with a welcome from um, Professor Amartya Sen, who reminded us uh, that the argumentative tradition of public reasoning in India goes back to the ancient past, goes back to the heart of some of the Hindu scriptures, of the debates between, of Bhagavad Gita really being a debate between Krishna and Arjuna, and according to him, the debate was not really settled. To the Rig Veda, which is really one of the most ancient, but one of the central Hindu texts, where in the 10th book, the 129th verse of the 10th book of the Rig Veda, as Sain points out, on creation seems to be skeptical about God himself, although the Adi Shankaracharya, the, one of the great Advaita philosophers, uses precisely that verse to reinforce the central tenets of his philosophy. But what we witnessed over the last one, two days is really a reinforcement of how vibrant, robust that argumentative tradition is in India today. In each one of the debates, beginning with the foreign policy debate and the overview given by His Excellency the Governor of Bengal, to the different views expressed on foreign policy choices before India today, to the debates on the economy, to the debates about the political system, to the masterly overview by Pratab Hanu Mehta, to the ones on skills and knowledge and demographic dividend, and on the media, there is no consensus. But there's clarity about views, clarity about how important it is to keep on sustaining that tradition of debate and dissent. There were unpalatable views, but that's the beauty of India. And that is why India is in some ways different. And so finally, we have to give us his view of India, India's political imagination, myths, dreams, and reality, a person who's really, in many ways, the conscience of India today grandson of two, two of the greatest Indians of modern time, the Mahatma and Rajaji, the first Governor General of Independent India. Gopal Krishna Gandhi has been a great civil servant who, who's been ambassador, governor, secretary, but more importantly, for, from our point of view, he's been a thinker who's thought of the nation, or th who's thought of India not just of India today, but what India should be. And through his writings and his speeches over the last two years, he's really, as I said, become the voice of what, we Indi what all thinking Indians want India to be. So it is a great honor, privilege, and pleasure to invite <coughs> Sri Gopal Krishna Gandhi to deliver the valedictory address at this conference. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Matu, for that generous introduction. And congratulations on, on the conception and the implementation of this splendid conference. It is very convenient to be thought of as a thinker because it leaves you free to do no work at all and to, to let that be done by, by those who are thinkers and, and doers. I am actually neither. And I must say, I'm quite uh, unequal to the task of giving a valedictory rounding off to a discussion which had so many parts to it, each fascinating, each, even if inconclusive, so totally real. But to indemnify myself against the criticism of vagueness, inaccuracy, 
or verbal Qatar. I've given myself a suitably vague subject, as you can see. But first things first, India. Named after an ancient river and famed for the world's most beautiful building, the Taj, and three of humankind's greatest sons, Gautama the Buddha, Shankara the Acharya, and Mohandas the Mahatma, and lauded for the various leaps of her ageless mind, India is blamed for the teeming number of stomachs she must feed, and very rightly shamed by her legacy of sectarian hatreds and the domineering temperament of her male offsprings. <laughs> now, that India of numberless languages and unnumbered dialects, Mr. Shorkar gave us some statistics of those, of people who live off their intellect and their reputations for thinking, and people who live off streets, and those that live precariously by salt marshes and in dense forests, and people who till lands as hard as moonscape and also as soft in some parts of India as fudge, and people who bully, and people who bring those bullies to heel, and people who, who, who exploit, and equally people who teach exploiters such lessons as they can never forget, and people in India who threaten and terrorize and people who return terror by counter-terror, and people who act bravely and write sagely, as well as people whose cowardice in the face of arrogance is sickening. And, of course, people who argue for and against arguing, and in the process re raise argumentation itself to a new genre, to a cult, in fact. And people who speak briefly, bless them, and people who are themselves very verbose, but blame others for their verbo verbosity, and then go on and on in sentences like mine that stretch like elastic never stretched. Now, that India, that very India of hugely differentiated people, ladies and gentlemen, is claimed and acclaimed and proclaimed so rightly by the world's evolving epic of civilizations and the history of democratic republics as absolutely, incontestably, their most remarkable heroine, India. Now, does that India, which has such a powerful cultural personality, such a tangle of agonies and such a bounty of blessings, does that India have to add to its preoccupations an active political imagination that could be called India's? political imagination. Never happy painted with one color. Does that India have one political imagination or many? The truthful answer is that India has as many political imaginations as there are political aspirations among her children. And in each of those imaginations is set an image or more than one image of what the person imagining India politically wants that India to be and what that person wants himself or herself within that India to be. And from the fresco of those myriad imaginings arise discussions, debates, arguments, even, but why even, in fact, contestations. And every dialectic has within it one or more myths, one or more dreams, one or more legends, larger than life, and indeed made of more than facts, made, in fact, of pure imagination. The political imagination of the Marxist-Leninist or the left-wing extremist, the LWE, as that kind of person is often called in officialese, is less clear than his political tactics are. But there lurks a certain image in that category of Indian, the left-wing extremist, amounting to an illustrated dialectic, a visual imagining that is mythic, rather than real, more mythic than real, and yet very real, as real sometimes as the trenches and the bunkers they live in. Now, Charu Majumdar, Kono Shanyal, and now a person who has recently come to be known by the name that he gave himself, Kishanji, 
form a mythic pantheon, which I shudder spinally to acknowledge. But there they are, giving Nokshalbari a morphology that pans out its ideology by the myths that they have unleashed and the legends which they have generated. Within what is called India's constitutional left, the communist who does not believe in violent revolution, though he or she has hearkened to the ones in Russia, China, Vietnam, Cuba, and the socialist who has been drawn to the democratic socialist traditions of Western Europe, have another register of political imaginations. The giant iconisms of communist citadels with their iconic leaders becoming larger than life images, Marx, Engels, and Lenin overarching all in a three-in-one terraced image populate the political imagination of the Indian left as mythic legends of real and magnified greatness. Now that cult of personality then plays itself into its own indigenous political myth-making through oversized posters celebrating its own homegrown left leadership, though rather strictly, almost invariably, post-mortem. Remarkably and admirably, Many exceptionally brave women, freedom fighters of the revolutionary school who belonged to the left have become myths and legends in themselves, like Preeti Lata Waddedar, Kalpana Datta later Kalpana Joshi, Ahilya Ranganekar, Matangini Hajra. All of them form a pantheon which is real in historical terms because they are all historical persons, but mythic because their lives, their deaths were of the stuff of legend. Aruna Asafili, heroine when she was seen and legend when she was not, stunning in her white khadi and her red beliefs, came as a later but star entrant. The left, anti-worship as it is, has its pantheons, and pantheons are for worship, for legends, for dreams. India socialists, have had a political imagination that also stays miraculously alive, though India's socialists have ceased almost to exist anywhere except perhaps in the columns of stoic journals like mainstream. Our socialist leaders, almost each of them, have been legends. Jayaprakash Narayan becoming a byword for all that is legendary, a phantom figure, dazzling when he was in action and puzzling when he was in repose making the Prime Ministership of India seem too small, almost petty for him. And he was a legend. But the Indian left draws its ideological fire from what can be called the realities of India. But its mythologies are as important as its ideology. And they are not drawn from any reality but from the myth-making traditions and propensities of India. I do not know if India's left will ever go away. I hope it does not, because the left will always have a role to play. But even assume India's left were to go away, the mythologies of India's left will never go away. The Indian right of the Hindutva variety with the RSS, the Hindu Mahasabha, the Shiva Sena and the BJP in that receding shade chart of saffron has a distinct political imagination of its own, dreaming of golden ages when Hindu monarchs ruled famously and conquered brazenly, taking the pennant mounted by Hanuman across lands on chariots and across seas on flotilla. Now, right-wing Hindutva imagination seeks to simulate those eras and those voyagings by borrowing the insignia of Indian mythology, their nomenclatures, and rigging up new mythic chariots mounted on Tata or Eicher trucks. <laughs> For multicolored reenactments of myths and legends, the Hindu rite is not to be excelled though its parallel footage run by contemporary players takes mythology to the world of animation. Sikh India has a powerful political imagination 
with legends and dreams that go back to Sikh royalty with Maharana Ranjit Singh and to Sikh politics with Master Tara Singh, giving it a strength and a fortitude that cannot be equaled. Muslim India's political imagination is perhaps the most complex and tormented of India's political imaginations. If I, Abdul, live in Srinagar, my political imagination is going to be about my safety. I do not want Pakistan to patronize me. I do not want Delhi to doubt me. I do not want militants to scare me. I do not want security men to search me. I want to be left alone, to dress as I choose, pray as I want to, and if I want to, to study and to find a job. And if I, Abdul, live in Malapuram or in Chennai or in Murshidabad, my political imagination is going to be very different. My Malayalam or my Tamil or my Bangla are better than my Urdu. And if I have a family in the Gulf or in Singapore, I want to be left alone to enjoy the prosperity that I have come into. I do not want anything to have to do with what may be called radicalism, fundamentalism. Last, least of all, jihad. But if I, Abdul, live in Gujarat, I want to forget 2002. But can I forget 2002? I do not have myths and legends so much as I have nightmares, not dreams, but nightmares. And I do not want to have to live through those nightmares again. And then if I am not Abdul, but if I am Fatima, anywhere in India, my problems are further complicated because I am either being told by the Orthodox to dress in a particular way or not in a particular way, and I am being advised by liberals to do exactly as I please. I want to be myself, but that is so difficult for myths, legends, dreams, doctrines, dogma surround me all the time. Some of these legends are rather new. The older ones of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the Ali brothers, the Qaeda Azam, of Shurawardi, of Maulana Azad, of Khan Abdul Ghaffar, the heroic Pathan, are now sepia prints. Others may have political imaginations like people have favorite writers or actors or musicians, but I, Fatima, or I, Abdul, our political imagination has fears for myths and worries for legends. My wafa, my iman, are asked to declare themselves in the colors of others' political imaginations, others' political dreams, others' political plans. My insaniyat remains my only undeclared position. Now, the political imagination of the Indian National Congress is very difficult to define. <laughs> but its chief characteristic has been its commitment to secularism, which to my mind is its best and most appealing introduction. It has also done more than others in embracing the plurality of the subcontinent. But then that plurality has its own political imaginations, which may be very different from the political imagination of the Indian National Congress. And within such sub-Indian political images, there are further sub-expressions seeking deconstructed attention to their segmented political aspirations, their political identities, their own political sub-imaginations. One hears now of homelands. We have Nagaland. We have demands raised for Bodo land and for Gurkha land. I must say I am disturbed by the homeland vocabulary. How will the political imagination of India view itself after 25 or 30 or 50 years of myths, legends, and dreams working towards a homeland? What will the future Indian political imagination think of itself? A female country trapped in a male nation, a motherland governed by a fatherland? No one ever said living in India is simple. In my political imagination, I sometimes feel 
India is culturally a motherland, constitutionally a fatherland, and socially one or other part of a jigsaw of several homelands, each of which is sustained by powerful myths, deathless dreams, and of course, compelling contemporary realities. Now, this being the reality of India's social and political condition, can we talk of an integrated political imagination that can be called Indian? I can respond rhetorically and say, yes, of course they do. I can respond diplomatically and say, perhaps quintessentially they do. But if I were to speak not for effect, but in frankness, I would say that they do not make for India's political imagination, but for the political imagination of an India that has history and geography combining it to make it a home to homelands and a father to fatherlands, but somewhere deep inside her scattered psyche to give rise to and sustain a mythic legend in the living concept of a motherland which is best known and understood by us simple folk as Mother India. Social scientists will squirm at this description, Mother India. Come on, they would say, Mother India has yielded place to India. And as a third person pronoun, she has given place to it. Do not romanticize something that is as dry as dust merely to justify the title of your lecture. <laughs> now, myths are imaginative constructs of the human mind. But the mind is not a myth. It is real. And a billion minds that believe in a myth and sustain a legend or a dream are a billion realities of their own kind. And when those billion people are also a politically enfranchised people, a politically awake people who participated in a mass struggle for freedom and later have voted not just energetically but with elan in over a dozen national elections, throwing parties and party leaders, including charismatic ones, into and out of office, that concept, the concept of India being a matriarch, Mother India, acquires a political charge. And it then takes its place in two concurrent imaginations, the cultural imagination and the political imagination. It is unthinkable that Jawaharlal Nehru could have titled his book The Discovery of Mother India, or that the Nehruvian author and historian Ramachandra Guha could have called his hugely successful book, India After Gandhi, Mother India After Gandhi, that would have had hilarious implications. <laughs> it is inconceivable that editor Siddharth Vadarajan could say, Mother India should tell the nuclear suppliers group to get off. <laughs> and yet, neither Guha nor Vardarajan may dispute the fact of the Mother India phenomenon and its hold on India's popular imagination. And though Guha did not include them in his volume on the great Indians, he would, I'm sure, concede that three figures who drew on the Mother India concept, the Mother India legend, the Mother India dream, with passion, Aurobindo Ghosh, Shaheed Bhagat Singh, and Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose have occupied India's political imagination as few other Indians have. I say this not to compare them with other statesmen politically, but to draw attention to the role of myth and legend in the political dynamics of India. The dramatic exiting of these personalities from the active political stage has much to do with the mythology that surrounds them, the legend making and the realities around their amazing lives. The transformation of Aurobindo from a political turbine into a spiritual recluse. The execution in his prime of the great son of Punjab and the disappearance both into the mists of time and the fog of rumors of Netaji aided the process. If Aurobindo and Mother India were umbilically linked, Bhagat Singh association with the magnetic song Rangade Basanti and the Ma in it 
and Netaji's identification in countless oleographs and plaster icons with Bharat Mata made the connection between myth and reality within India's political imagination complete. Shugoto Bose tells us in his fascinating new book on Netaji how the young Subhash asked his own mother, will not any son of Mother India in total disregard of his selfish interest dedicate his whole life to the cause of the mother? Now for the majority of India's Hindu middle class, irrespective of what India's social scientists may say, for the majority of India's Hindu middle class, which thinks in a patois of India's languages and its own assimilated and Indianized version of English, reads the so-called vernacular papers which are blooming in their circulations, watches religion-centered TV channels, cheers Indian test cricket teams lustily, and visiting teams only courteously. Mother India, to them, is no archaism. For the Bengali, not excluding the communist Bengali, an inborn affinity to the image of Durga or Kali or Bhavani as beautifully sculpted and re-sculpted each year for worship makes Mother India both mythical and real. Fluxing seamlessly into India's magnetic national song, Vande Mataram, the Bharat Mata image has the Himalaya for a coronet and is adorned with necklace strings representing her rivers. None may mess with that Bharat Mata. Who would dare to? The Congress, as it was during Gandhi's leadership of India, did not stress or make use of the Bharat Mata image, though Gandhi himself rather untypically inaugurated a certain Bharat Mata temple. I believe this has something to do with the resentment aroused by certain verses in the Vande Mataram song among Muslim Indians, verses which had a direct connection with the mother goddess concept. And I think it was only right that the Congress chose caution over tradition in this matter. But the connection and the connecting have returned. The charisma of Indira Gandhi, after the phenomenal surge in her popularity following the 1971 war which led to the birth of Bangladesh, also led to her being likened spontaneously and compellingly with the goddess Durga and by extension with the mother India image. I do not know what she herself thought of this. I should have imagined, and I think she probably was very embarrassed by it, but knowing her country and its people, she must have thought this inevitable and not worth correcting. Be that as it may, later, some powerful women chief ministers have also come to be likened to the likeness. Neither they nor India's political imagination can be blamed for this transference of an undying myth to that which becomes a living legend and then a part of the political imagination, if only for a few years. But blame and credit apart, the fact is that Popular imagination has led to mythologies which are entirely imaginary, mythologies which have led into dreams and which are part imaginary and part fact-based, and both together have populated the political imagination in India, affecting the course of Indian politics and the careers of Indian politicians. In Maharashtra, the Shiv Sena, headed by a male supremo, has nonetheless found the lion image associated with Mother India very congenial. And in the choice of its name, the party has skillfully linked itself to a historical figure of such trans-historic appeal as to have become India's great legend, Chhatrapati Shivaji. And the Shiva Sena thereby has consolidated the myth-legend, myth-dream tradition within India's political imagination. Tamil politics has always been a codicil to national hypotheses. Its extraordinary movement for Dravidian self-respect, partly because of its logical confrontation with Brahmin orthodoxy and therefore with Hindu religious practices, adopted rationalism 
as its major intellectual plank and position. Indeed, in its distancing from traditional Hindu and religious standpoints, the Dravidian movement led by Periyar and by the scholarly C. N. Anadure could not have done better. But it did not replace, it did not replace in Dravidian India's political imagination myths and legends by non-mythical historical narratives or anti-legend propositions of empirical thought. Rather, it replaced earlier myths and legends by new ones that grew out of its own evolution. If anti-Brahmin and therefore non-religious atheistic Dravidism could not have any place for goddesses interchangeable with Mother India, could the movement do away with goddessness itself? No. In came Tamil, the language. Classical, compelling, creative, the language had and has everything in it to saturate a person's sense of cultural and linguistic identity. And what was earlier a highly prized cultural possession, a linguistic treasure, now became a political palladium, a political resource, the very article of ultimate faith in the political imagination of Dravid in India, a veritable goddess, Mother Tamil. If Tamil Nadu's and then Vishal Andhra's and Greater Karnataka's political movements have turned to language legends, turning their leaders into living legends, Kerala has not been without similar parallels either. Prakash Karat, the General Secretary of the CPM, has said that in contrast to the one nation single culture model put out by the dominant bourgeois leadership of the national movement, only he can use a phrase like this with such ease and felicity. <laughs> put out by the dominant bourgeois leadership of the national movement, it is the communists who pioneered studies on the linguistic nationality question in India and EMS Nambudiripad undertook the job of tracing the development of the linguistic nationality of the Malayalam people and provided the theoretical basis for Aikya Kerala. No wonder, now this is me, not Karat, no wonder that EMS's inspiring of land-based movements in Kerala, like the Michabhumi Samaram, led EMS to become a living legend in Kerala. Mother India, an oleograph legend, ties into the politics and surrounds the question of land and water today. Sentiment against diversions Malappropriations and large-scale acquisitions of land are national pulsings, not esoteric values. There is, in India's political imagination today, a real and tangible resentment over the privileged access to our forest resources and to our mineral wealth, paralleling earlier exploitations of the colonial era, particularly in the matter of access to coal and iron ore, now enjoyed by monopolists with a direct nexus to politics and to electoral politics. A violation, no less, is perceived in this. And there is a sense of honor involved in this as well. And that sense of honor has something to do with myth, legend, and dreams. Honor, especially in the holding and managing of land, so-called and real, was the subject of Mahmood Khan's film, which people of my generation in this hall might remember, Mother India. That 1957 film was remarkable in making a woman played unforgettably by Nargis, a symbol of a struggling and yet redemptive womanhood. There is more to Mahmood Khan's film than Radha claiming her titles and her stakes in land. It is about the future of land use, use, land use and land uses in India. So difficult to acquire, so tough to hold, and so easy to lose. Sunita Narayan put it very well recently. She said, wherever I have been, people resisting takeover of land have told me that the land is their mother. This is Sunita Narayan, 2012. 
They cannot sell it. This is a sentiment most of us literate and urban Indians cannot grasp. For us, land is property we buy and sell to suit our interest. We cannot understand this obduracy because we do not understand the value of land-based occupation. Land is their mother. Seeking fulfillment and reassurance about land rights and livelihood rights in the realities of today, India's political imagination creates new mythic aspirations as well. I came across recently a highly pertinent observation of Balfour's quoted by Dr. Ambedkar on the English Constitution. Balfour says, we must study temperament and character rather than intellect and theory. Constitutions are easily copied, temperaments are not. And if it should happen that the borrowed constitution and the native temperament fail to correspond, this is very important, ladies and gentlemen, quoted by Ambedkar. If it should happen that the borrowed constitution and the native temperament fail to correspond, the misfit may have serious results. India's temperament, or rather the temperaments of the many Indias that make up India, incline towards myths and legends and dreams, the most important of which is morphologically geopolitical, Mother India, and which links incredibly through that very mythic legend to the greatest reality of today's India, which is about Indians, ordinary Indians' association with their motherland, their land, their title, their acre, their quarter acre, and its resources. New mythologies are being created, and new legends and dreams constructed over this association. But with one of our resentments or another concretizing into an agitation, led by what Mr. Dua mentioned as the noise parties of today. There is much to be seen in the value of our myths, our legends and dreams. If only to be able to overarch those myths and legends and dreams, not by myths outworn, but by new infusions of contemporary meaning into those myths, as in a sense Gandhi did when he invoked to Nehru's discomfiture the concept of Ram Raj. I believe a new infusion of meaning into the infinite possibilities of an inclusive Mother India which has place for all her sons and daughters of all her sons and daughters' various creeds that infusion, reverting to a primordial India, but progressing to a new and modern India, is the best guarantor of our stability. Not a jejun dismissal of myths or an opportunistic, opportunistic embracing of myths. I believe that India, being greater than its vicissitudes, great as those are, and stronger than its challenges, formidable as those are, that India, with its babel of tongues, its argumentative citizens, and its speakers who speak as endlessly as this speaker is speaking, that India will in fact be a triumph of stoic endurance as you, ladies and gentlemen, have been this evening. May I request Professor... May I now... May I now request Professor Elliot to come to the stage to give the vote of thanks, please? Former Governor Gandhi, when I had the great privilege of being in India two weeks ago with Amitabh, 
he took Robert Johansson, the Deputy Chancellor of the University, and myself to a carpet and shawl, pashmina shop. He'd checked it out very carefully with his mother, who knows the best of all things. And there, Robert bought a carpet, and I bought a shawl, a Kashmiri shawl, of such beauty. I bought it from my mother, whose 80th birthday is in two weeks. But I'm going to very reluctantly hand it to her because it has been hand-sewn with such intricacy and such beauty, the colour, the forms, the softness and the texture are remarkable. So I'm going to make sure it's in her will for me once <laughs> in a very, very, very long time when I hope to get it back. I feel that tonight we've had a lecture like this Kashmiri shawl it wove and took our flights of imagination with yours. The, the lyricism, the, the crafting of your words. If we think of the Indian Abdul, who Pakistan will not patronise, who Delhi will not doubt, who the security men will not search. Just one sentence in a wonderful speech, which took me places which I do not know but will now go and read with, a, with Amitabha as my guide because it really was an outstanding way to end this conference. And it has been a remarkable conference. We started with the words of a Nobel laureate and then the deeply insightful lecture that we had from the current governor of West Bengal telling us about the political realities of foreign affairs within India. We've then woven our way through media, politics, education, a whole swathe of areas. And I've learnt so much about India. And that was the remit of the Australia India Institute, to bring to Australians such as I an understanding and a knowledge of India's culture, its politics, its people, its myths and imaginings. And I think we've had that over the last two and a half days. So in thanking former Governor Gandhi, I'd also like to thank Amitabh and his team at the Australia India Institute. I, when I talk to people about this conference, everyone just shakes their head in amazement that Amitabh has been able to bring together so many remarkable people. We have governors, members of parliament from India and Australia. We have leaders of the press, of education, of law, of a whole range of disciplines, far too broad for me to be able to explain or to properly encompass. We've had fabulous talks from people from think tanks and sparking off, should India be non-aligned, should it partner with all, should it partner with the US? Just wonderful talks and panel debates. And I think it is really only Amitabh who could have drawn such a remarkable audience, remarkable group of intellects. I feel as though in the last two and a half days I've stood on the very broad shoulders of these amazingly lofty intellects and had a feast of the mind in the year. So Amitabh, Christopher Kremer, who's just come very recently to the Institute, former director John Webb, Jaisal Shaw and Elise Vagoni, who've been very involved in the conference, Nick Hill and all others who are here from the Institute, I'd like to thank you very deeply for what you've given us, and I'd like to, everyone to thank you. So thank you very much, everyone. I do want to thank the audience which has been here on a Friday in Melbourne at 6.30. You wouldn't usually find so many people. Uh, thank you for staying on. And a small announcement to the speakers. There's a bus to take you to our dining place right outside. You won't be going to your hotel but to our uh, venue of our dinner this evening. And I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.